School, and I'm excited to present to you this panel, the Dreamers Toolkit, a space of people thinking through Web3 and infrastructure. We're going to have people briefly, look at this, this I joke, this is like Parliament. We've got a bunch of people on stage. You can be part of the crew. Um, but we're going to talk about that thing, Web3. Heard about it? NFTs? Um, let me just introduce our panel, and then we'll, everybody will quickly present what they're up to, and then we'll get into a discussion. would love to hear from you, too. If you don't have questions, that's crazy. It's all questions. Who's got the answers? All right. So um, my name is Nato Thompson. I'm a self-described cultural infrastructure builder, curator, author. I say infrastructure builder because I think at the time we're in, it's time to think about alternative ways of us being together in the arts. Next to me is Kevin McCoy. Um, with his partner Jennifer McCoy, our New York-based digital media artist whose work extends across film and video. Um, the McCoy's work has been featured in exhibitions from Pompidou, MoMA, British Film Archive, uh, and Sundance Film Festival. And of course, I don't know if you know this, but Kevin also is famous for minting the world's first NFT. That's, that responsibility is on you. I'm joking. All right. Um, next to Kevin is Eileen Isagon Skyers, an artist, writer, curator, and the director of marketing for Friends with Benefits DAO. Anybody got questions about DAOs? What? <laughs> yes, exactly. We love. Give, it, you give it up. Give it up for Friends with Benefits. That's what, okay, cool. She's worked with contemporary art and nonprofit arts organizations, including David Zwerner, Whitney Museum, Rhizome, New Museum, Portland Institute of Contemporary Art, and the Digital Museum of Digital Art. Thank you, Eileen, for being here. Awesome. Um, next, Michaela Bailey from Rhizome. Give it for Rhizome. Woo! Yeah, yeah, okay. Co executive director at Rhizome at the New Museum. If you haven't visited and seen it, you should. Bailey has held curatorial positions at MoMA Studio Museum in Harlem, where she organized the institution's first digital exhibition titled Hearts in Isolation. She's been featured in Art Forum, Art News, Freeze, Harper's, Bazaar, Hyperallergic, Pinup, and ID Magazine. Her current research traverses environment, black access, and the creation of an equitable historical accounting of born digital art. Ooh, that's, thank you for being here. Awesome, and finally, Malcolm Levy, who's also probably coming off quite a ride as Refraction had a festival, correct? You have it up for Refraction Dow? In the back, can I hear you in the back? All right, sorry. Uh, Refra uh, is a multidisciplinary artist and curator based in Toronto. His practice encompasses visual and video art curation, design, writing, music, and interactive art. Malcolm is the founder of Refraction Dow. The DAO's mission is to empower and uplift creatives through community building and world-class cultural experiences. He's also the chief cur creative director of Generate. Before that, he was the director of New Forms Festival from 2001 to 2016 and the curator of Code Live, the digital festival during the 2010 Olympics Games in Vancouver. I'm learning this as I read. All right, well, listen. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Appreciate that. And thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to do a little quick shilling for Art World and then I'm gonna um, turn it over to our panelists to talk. Um, briefly, so what is Art World? I'll have a little, if you, is that on there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can't even see, okay, cool, cool, I'll stand. So we are a digital arts platform. I used to work at a place called Creative Time where we did large scale public art. Can I give for a creative time? <laughs> so we did large scale uh, contemporary art, but I would say often, I think public art is a political project which is art that meant something about the historical positionality that we are in. It wasn't just art to make you feel good in life, but art to make you think about the conditions of the world we're in. And I really loved it. And I also joked public art was 16 times the work, half the love. A million people worked on it. You bust your ass for two years and then everyone tells you how problematic it is. Welcome to the world of public art. But I really loved it. And the thing I loved the most is working with artists who make dope projects that were historically important. With Art World, I just quickly, we did a project with the artist Waleed Rod, who's one of my co-founders. There's a project called Festival of Gratitude. Tough timing, their series of birthday cakes for dictators. He's a snarky artist. So we had cakes for Assad, uh, Vladimir Putin, all the heroes, uh, Thatcher. Anybody want to get an autocrat they like? Erdogan, uh, Bolsonaro. And then if you bought it, it opened up into a bunch of slices that you could purchase as well. Here's some slices. Uh, here's the cake. We just had an Assad cake. So uh, the other part I'll say what's really important, and this is the thing I really want to say too is, 
proceeds from every project go to nonprofits. And if you think of the commercial world, if it actually every purchase that we made here, if you made purchases, supported an infrastructure of equity and sustainability globally, what a different art world we would live in today. Just to think about revenue streams and how they are generated. From Christie's to Sotheby's to Zwerner, whatnot, how, much, how you want your money to go out there. How much accountability? How long you want to be passively sitting here watching bucks fly around and none of it makes a world we care about? How long are the arts the lamest situation in the world? Can't we be the best? Pitch for the art world in general. We worked with artist, um, oh, is that my going forward? Shirin Nishat, this is just briefly, there's a project called Lost for Words. Is it going? Let me see, yeah. Is it stuck? Yep. You wanna do it? Thanks, Emily. So we worked with Shirin Nishat. What we do is we work with artists to imagine a project and then we work with digital production teams to actually envision them and then secure them through blockchain. You can check them on our site. But also just make things that are absolutely important about the world we're in. That's that. And then, so that's a cool project. That just launched a month ago. And then this one, we just launched. This is with artists from Turkey, Ahmet Ogut. He's t Kurdish, lives in Turkey. He did a series of monuments to whistleblowers including um, everyone from Karen Silkwood to Aaron Schwartz, folks that blew the, it was inspired by Edward Snowden who blew the whistle on the NSA, but it's people that stood up to power. What he wanted to do was make monuments to them where with your phone you can actually go around. If you go to the Arwood site, you can do it. I've been doing it all over Miami. And you can actually download the AR app. It'll just show up on your phone and you can place monuments wherever you are. It's kind of fun if you want to do some AR fun. So we literally make monuments in digital space that you can take photos of in the world. So that's some of the project, and that's available right now. That's launched, it's on, and you can check that out. So anyways, that's Art World. I wanted to give you an introduction to what we do, um, but not too long. So thanks for coming, and I'll now turn it over to the creator of NFTs, uh, and an artist and someone I like a lot and we're working with, uh, Kevin McCoy. Um, yeah. The, uh, I've had the I'm, I'm old, and so I've made art in Web 1.0, I've made art on Web 2.0, and now Web 3.0. And um, it's interesting to me to see how much things stay the same uh, in many ways, you know? Uh, and the struggles, uh, it's always a struggle making a, making a good artwork, you know? It doesn't matter what the medium is, you know, usually you don't quite get it, and you're always trying to figure out how to do, do the next thing, you know, and, and try to get it better. Um, and the, the, the promise of Web3 is, you know, there's a weird question of like, why? Why Web3? You're like, why should you, wh wh what's the big deal? I mean, why, you know? It's, it's difficult, uh, it's cumbersome, it's fragile, um, you know, and so, but it's based on this promise, right? A promise of, that comes down to a promise of autonomy, right? That, that, that you, and you, and you or you and your friends have control over your information, uh, over your data, and over your um, economy. You know that you can kind of make, a, make, make an economy uh, and a creative economy that, um, that, that you directly control. Um, and those things are true. Those things, those things do happen, and, and, and it is there. But at the same time, you know, if, 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 you've, if you've spent any time in the world of, 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 of blockchains and crypto or paid attention in the news in the last month, you know that it's like, you know, full of scammers and there's all kinds of things that can go wrong and there's all kinds of ways that you can, you know, not have the thing that you have. And, 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 the, and, you know, th and it's easy to get shut down, it's easy to get lost. And so, you know, as a, as a maker, I'm thinking about ideas, I'm thinking about work, trying to make work, um, and you're always calibrating your idea vis-a-vis -vis the tool. And is this tool 
the right tool for the job? Why am I using it? What am I trying to get out of it? What, you know, is it, is it, is it you know, speaking in some way? You know, is it coming to life in some way? Um, and uh, so, yes, I don't have a big, I don't have a big pitch, um, but to say that the, the origin of the NFT, I'm proud of the origin of the NFT. I'm proud that the idea, um, I, didn't, I didn't call it that. It was before the Web3 moniker, before the NFT moniker. I had a different name, better name. But um, the, uh, uh, um, I'm proud of the fact that it came out of an artist's practice. I'm, prou I'm proud of the fact that it came out of the New York digital art scene, which is just a fantastic scene and has been for decades. Um, you know, but it's this technology is as, as a maker this technology is best when it is really closely tied to your practice and so if you are a you know in some way figuring out like how can i connect to it how can i use it to speak um in a, in a new way uh, and if you can answer that question for yourself there's a lot of great possibilities with it that's it thanks kevin thanks kevin everyone give it for kevin i'm gonna keep it lively it's four o'clock you know we gotta keep it here all right, Eileen, we're over to you. Hello, just checking that my mic works. Um, um, yeah, so I am the marketing director at Friends with Benefits DAO. Um, DAO is, it, DAOs are kind of a, I mean, it's loosely interpreted many different ways. Um, I guess the acronym stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, and each of those terms, um, you know, they're different levels of decentralization across many DAOs. There's different levels of autonomy, but as Kevin mentioned, um, DAOs as a form of tooling within the ecosystem of Web3 really are um, a way for groups of people to collectively organize. And Friends with Benefits DAO is um, a, it's a social DAO. It started during uh, the pandemic in 2020 as an experiment by the founder Trevor McFedries, who started sending people these tokens, friends with benefits tokens, um, and asking them to join this Discord. It started as a very small community and grew and grew um, from all these different kinds of creatives, musicians and artists, um, chefs, event, organiza event organizers, excuse me, producers, um, and it's now a, a membership base of almost 3,000 people globally. We have a decentralized events program. We've hosted a couple of events this week. Um, we have one starting um, this evening as well. Um, but I've really started my journey with Friends with Benefits towards the beginning, contributing to their editorial platform. And um, prior to that, my journey into Web3 really started at Foundation, which is an NFT um, marketplace. And before that, I was working uh, as NATO shared, um, in the more traditional art space. Um, I was working at David's Werner for a couple of years on their online viewing rooms um, and really have always been fascinated by, you know, digital art, net art, and media artists and how they've worked to subvert our expectations of the internet and the technologies and the tools that we, we use. Um, hi everyone, I'm Michaela Bailey. I'm the co-executive director of Rhizome. Um, Rhizome is a nonprofit digital arts organization. We're based in New York City and we're an affiliate of the New Museum. Um, since 1996, we've been championing digital artists and um, digital culture as well. Um, and we've been, you know, a part of, you know, major cultural moments, um, such as the minting of the first NFT at Rhizome's um, 7 on 7 conference which is where we um, pair an artist with a technologist and challenge them to make something new. Um, after a pandemic break, 7 on 7 will be relaunching this year in the fall, um, and we're really excited for that. But um, my personal background is in like, curatorial work. And so you know, the, word, like, the root of the word curatorial means to care. And so in this digital space, I'm thinking a lot about what it means to care for like the long-term legacy of like our cultural production. I think every individual person has like a sort of like distributed footprint. Um, I remember like working in an archive at MoMA and like looking at like telegrams and you know letters and all these kind of things and I think a lot about like where these things will exist in like you know in terms of like what what we live what, what we leave behind. Um, and Rhizome has open access like preservation tools that allows um, anyone to kind of preserve interactive versions of the way that like um, parts of the way that they engage online. 
Um, and on December 10th, we're going to be presenting the first major museum presentation of Cyber Pow Wow, which was one of the first major online exhibitions. Um, and Cyber Pow Wow was and is um, an indigenously determined, like interactive, you know, online exhibition space that was launched in 1997 by the Nation to Nation Collective. Um, as part of that launch, um, we're also going to be restoring the project so it will be fully functional. Um, one thing that Rhizome does is create kind of like broadly applicable preservation strategies for digital artwork so that as things go obsolete over time, you can still engage with these, um, these artworks on your contemporary devices. Um, so we're really excited about that and excited to talk about you know, the future of what this could mean for us as our digital culture continues to change. I'm Malcolm Levy from Refraction DAO. Refraction DAO is also a decentralized organization. We operate very much as a collective. We're an artist-run DAO, which I think is a little different in the space than most other DAOs because we really treat artists um, first and foremost in the DAO. Uh, we have over a thousand artists in the DAO, musicians, creatives, etc. We operate all around the world. Our main focus are different events. We've done over 20 events all over the world at this point. We did a few days of a festival here um, this week. And we collect art by different artists in the space. Um, we, our token is free. So basically the way that we operate the DAO is that it's accessible to anyone who would want to come in and you just apply to get in based on your practice, based on why you want to join the DAO, everything you want to do in and around it. And what we really believe in terms of like Web3 is very similar to some kind of what Kevin was saying earlier. It's like an opportunity for creatives to really move forward in a different way for culture and the artist run culture to really allow that to happen in a way that, you know, hasn't always happened in different times historically. And so that's what we're doing. We're building out an artist run marketplace that's going to come in the next year. Um, we're going to continue doing events all over the world and yeah. Thanks, give it up for Malcolm. Thank you guys. So, you know, just to, we're gonna do some conversation, you know how it goes, we do conversation when you guys ask questions. So, you know, it's Miami week, this is crazy time in the arts. It's always been crazy, there's so much stuff going on. I always feel like, every time I come here, I'm like, how are there so many people in the arts, it's nuts. Then, throw on this NFT Web3 on top of it, it just went next level. Let me just start with Michaela and Kevin, you know, the fake people. Let's, let's talk about early digital art in New York. And like, I kind of want some kind of your perspectives on how you're seeing it happen because it seems like an NFT time. It's three months is like a long time ago, right? Like pre -F after FTX crash and all this kind of stuff. But what are your observations about your, the ways in which the, the communities are merging or complexities there because there are very different audiences. There's very different scenes. I just want to get your sense on that. Um, I really want Kevin to set the scene if, <laughs> if, if, he, if he would be so kind um, and then I can follow up off of that. Uh, yeah. I moved to New York in 96 and fell in. Um, the, first, the, the first person I met like the first week was this guy, Ricardo Dominguez who is part of this uh, group called the Electronic Disturbance Theater, which is a really amazing um, art organization. And uh, he pioneered the concept of the digital sit-in uh, in, in support of uh, Zapatista, uh, the Zapatista movement in, in Southern Mexico uh, and, and created tools. He and a group of other people were creating these tools to uh, enable civil disobedience uh, and, and, and introducing that concept. It was really great. And that was all happening in the context of, a, of this physical place, an IRL place uh, called The Thing, uh, which was in, in Chelsea. And The Thing started off as, uh, uh, you know, kind of pre-internet in a dial-up uh, bulletin board system and then transitioned into um, a, a, a place where artists could come, create, you know, get, get online, create websites, um, do, do events. Uh, and a lot of the um, New York scene started there, but not all of it. Um, uh, and then there was, some other, there was some other organizations doing things too, Fake Shop and some other really great things back in the day. Um, but the, um, 
it was, what's interesting about that time, and it was totally marginal, everyone was interested, you know, kind of coming from the art world, you know, or interested in the art world in, in, in some sense, um, and, and felt that they were part of the art world, but there wasn't very much space for it. But there was some space. And what's interesting to me now to see is like, you know, that changed into the, you know, kind of coming into the, uh, into the aughts or whatever, um, you know, and then media art really started finding a home in the art world. And so there was a place where, you know, in, like, in, in big, big festivals, Documenta, whatever, Venice, of course, would have these you know, big elaborate media shows. And so media art had a real presence um, within the, you know, kind of capital A art world. And what's interesting to see is how Web3 has altered that, that state of affairs. In some ways, it turned up the contrast filter massively in the sense that now there's much more, I feel like, much more of a hard edge between technology, art that has technology and art that doesn't have technology. And to a certain extent, I feel like the art world has bunkered down um, around traditional forms, um, and, and, you know, for, intentionally or not, and now all of the media art stuff isn't part of that kind of halo anymore, and it's all been absorbed, for better or worse, you know, um, by the, um, by the NFT community, by the Web3 community. Uh, and that's been really interesting to see because the Web3 community is very different than the art world, you know? And so people that kind of have come up, you know, directly in that world, you know, it's all great. Um, but there's a bunch of people that are kind of like awkwardly in between, you know, that, that have, f have feet in, in, in all those worlds. Um, and so that, that kind of like forcing function of NFTs and blockchain to kind of then just absorb everything that can be absorbed in digitally going there and then everything that is kind of physical kind of, kind of you know, going there. Now this is separate from like events and I think the event space and, the, and thinking about events is, is, is where um, uh, uh, Web3 is really, really shining. You know, it's really great. Um, but from a kind of like art object standpoint, it's like it's either tech and you got to deal with NFTs or it's not tech and you're... You're, you're in an art fair. Mm. Yeah, I think for me, the thing that keeps me interested in art is the idea of like a conversation and people engaging with each other. Um, and for me, you know, digital art or generative art, it has like a really long history. Um, and I, I love definitions, so like I'm gonna read the definition that I got from the Artblocks website actually, that kind of points back to like the larger history of um, generative art itself. Um, so. On their website, they're saying that generative art is an art form in which an artist develops a system for the creation of individual works. With historical roots in conceptual art, today generative art typically entails the creation of an algorithm using computer code. Randomness is often introduced into the artist's algorithm, and the system will output a unique artwork. Um, and so I think like while that's new, it's also very old, and I, it's something that I think about in relation to like the history of this is just like, like Kevin was saying, with like Web 1.0, Web 2.0, Web 3.0, there's often this like narrative of like a new frontier or like manifest destiny, and it's, for me, it's actually really interesting that like, you know, Silicon Valley's in California, which is like the final frontier, um, and it's also kind of uncanny that a lot of the people who were like, you know, just like at the forefront or the cutting edge of like American expansion um, are also the ones who are, you know, like really early in these spaces. Um, and I think like the narrative of being early is also interesting because it um, lets us off the hook for a lot of things. And so I think like, yeah, just talking about the precursors um, is always gonna be helpful. Thanks for that. I appreciate that both of that. And I was thinking too, just, you know, early digital art, rhizome, eye beam, like there was, a, <laughs> I was joking, like digital artists brush your soldiers off because they always, I was like, either they sweated down the art world or they're like, fuck this, I'm going to Google. That was the kind of like, that was the way it was going to go, you know? And they were, you know, there was like a guy like Bitforums or a few folks, but there wasn't like a lot, you know? So there's a, there's for, for some of those folks, like the older digital artists, there's a little bit of a chip on the shoulder going on. You know what I mean? They're like, yeah, oh, now you love me. Now you got your like crypto punk shit going on. And now you got, now you love me. All right. So. I'm joking, but I'm not, you know. Like, I was joking, there was a ZKM curator, the digital art, and, like, he, like, bought some crypto punks early on. And then I pictured the director of ZKM being like, I think there's some very valuable art suddenly in the digital art collection. And I was like, they're like, bring him to this, they're like, he's never met the board. And he's, like, been there 20 years. I'm like, bring him up, bring the digital art curator up. We need to talk to digital art. But it's true, it's cool. Digital art's got a new cred, but there's also money floating around. Let's talk to the DAOs. To the DAOs. Um, 
so, you know, that's very new, I would say. But certainly in the history, to go to what Michaela's saying, in the history of the arts, artists teaming up to get stuff done isn't new. And, the, and so there's an interesting history there. It's also a troubled history, I might say. You know, I mean, Joseph Stalin said, every person is a problem. And certainly never more so true than in a collective. Or maybe not, you know, I'm, I grew up in a commune. So let me start with Malcolm and then I'll go to Eileen. But maybe you could talk about just the functions of a DAO. And if you could take on DAO slightly, like how, how do you coordinate? And maybe also some typologies, because there are very different ones out there. I mean, there's some DAOs, I'm gonna tell you, that look like cartels more than they look like DAOs to me. So l let me just, just um, let me in on what's going on. Right, and I think that like the first point you made, like historically, you know, collectives, artists run centers. This is something that's been going on quite a long time. You know, since the 70s, 80s, all the way through today. And in the digital art world since the 90s, really. So it's, it's really important to understand that, you know, a lot of, say, the more art-focused DAOs really come from that history at the same time. Um, in terms of, like, the organization of a DAO, you know, the joke I always kind of make or, is that the most important part of a decentralized autonomous organization is the organization. Because it's incredibly challenging. It's almost like a social sculptural art project in itself to actually figure that side out. Um, so in our case, you know, we have almost these different pods around the world where because they are coming from you know, the art, music, production, media art world, electronic music world, etc., they already have like a collective understanding. You know, so for instance, when we had the event here, the entire team on the ground working on the event are all part of the DAO. They're like the Miami folks in the DAO. And it's very interesting because so many of the members of the DAO that were here were commenting on how it just felt so natural. Huh. Which is a very, very interesting thing to find in any space. So what we really do is we kind of continually are checking in and thinking about different ways of organizing these different things that we do. You know, how do we collect? How do we do our events? How do we curate artists? How do we commission? We just did a big creative grants program. How are we going to do that? Are we going to allow folks to apply that are outside the DAO or inside the DAO? And these are all discussions, you know? Um, I would say, you know, within it, it's not like, you know, every single, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people are all basically sending their opinions in on everything either. The governance is real, but in reality, you have more of a core group of like, you know, a certain amount of people who are working on these projects or might talk to specific other guilds and folks within the DAO to work on different things. And we try to like really keep it as open as possible, but also like in an organized way. So that people have a- Do you have a map of that? I always feel like I wanna like, I wanna yeah. get, I, I totally feel like sure. young so artists that wanna do that are like, side. how do I do that? Yeah, how do so, I not do that? So I mean, basically, if you can imagine it, it's almost like, like a circle, let's yeah. say. And in it, you have kind of these different pods that are doing different things, the community group, the, you know, partnerships group, the curation group, you know, the production group, et cetera. And, we, and the design group, let's say, or editorial, and they all kind of work together around the different initiatives that we're doing. And what we've realized is that over time, there were a lot of questions, oh, is this going to be interesting or that, or do people, you know, and what we found is we found these particular, um, we're kind of like a, a focused or, you know, a focused DAO in a sense, like a DAO that has a specific mission and mandate. So as we've really honed in on that, what we found is like people come into the DAO literally because they want to get involved in these things. They understand like why they're coming in. Right. And so we kind of imagine it's kind of like a circle where everything connects. You know? I love it. I love it. Eileen, let's go over to Friends with Benefits. Talk to us about that structure. Is it the same as what Malcolm's talking about? Is it different? Friends with Benefits, I'd say, differs from Refraction DAO. And in, in, as you said, it's an artist-run DAO. It's a specific focus around curation and events. And while Friends with Benefits does host many events as well, it's, it's more of a social DAO. So it's, it's a social experiment, really. And functionally speaking, there are a lot of parallels. There's a core team. There are different pods working on you know, events, curation, editorial, and things like that. And it does also harken back to, you know, applications in the real world that have predated, you know, this blockchain technology coming in to power these collectivized efforts. Um, one of the editorial pieces that we publish that we point to a lot actually is Austin Roby's piece 
on um, what co-ops and DAOs can learn from each other. And he really breaks down and compares, you know, all of the different facets that, that co-ops um, have really um, always had as, as part of their um, collectivization and organizing that DAOs um, can also pull from and vice versa. Um, and I'd say that one of the most interesting points that he makes um, in that piece is, is it's really about like how how DAOs, um, well, sorry, sorry, co-ops um, sort of um, function oftentimes to collectivize towards like material goods and, and bettering people's material lives. Whereas DAOs have often, you know, had different single use purposes like Constitution DAO, which like came about just to um, collectively try and purchase the US Constitution and things like that. So, you know, um, we're gonna get to you folks shortly, but I just wanna ask my esteemed crew here, what questions do you have in what you're working on? Like, cause I'm like, I just gotta say, you know, that FTX collapse thing, right? Like, I didn't get into Web3 so that I could exp try to rationalize FTX to right. people. You know what I mean? And I, I'm so over being associated with that crypto crap. Yeah. So like, I just want to, I'm always saying that because it's hard enough getting people's heads around what a DAO is or an NFT. I don't need this crud floating around, but that's where my head's at, right? It's like, we're in a weird crew or it's just being globbed all together. But I want to ask you, what are the questions you guys have? Or when, when people ask me a question like that, yeah. I usually say, you're right. I completely agree. Yeah. You know, like something like Web3 is not something that's just used by a bunch of crypto bros to do whatever. You know, a lot of the most interesting early cases of Web3 are actually from artists, right. which is very similar to almost every movement in history. You know, and so it's like really important to point that out. And so most people, when I said it, it's like, you know, of course that's like, there's these weird parts of it, just like, you know, the mortgage collapse or any other yeah. sketchy thing that's happened with capitalism and business over the last however many years, you know. Appreciate that. You guys, anyone want to jump in on something? Right. Similar to, to what Malcolm was saying, like the blockchain isn't really here to correct human error. You know, it, it's here to create an agnostic public record. Um, so the fact that there are scammers and hackers and things like that, there were scammers and hackers with Web 2.0 and with Web 1.0 as well. Um, yeah, one thing that I was, you know, I guess I was kind of like going around the, the like, you know, the fairs and stuff this week, talking to people in Web3 and like just seeing about like what they were excited about. Um, and something that came up, I was talking to Kilani Nicole, who founded Transfer Gallery, and also Lady Phoenix um, yesterday. And they were talking about like digital legacy and like the idea that people in our generation may be, end up kind of like cash poor, but data rich. And like, how do you think? like kind of like steward whether it's like decentralized or through like you know almost like a family office for your your footprint um how do you steward that like what what happens to all of this cultural production that we're making um i even remember like i had a conversation with david rudnick briefly and like an, an artist and designer and he, he like called crypto like death naive you know and it's really interesting it's like what happens if you die unexpectedly and like no one has your like access to your wallet um, so I don't know if that's exciting or morbid, but I, I think like as like digital art and digital artists age, like there are things like, you know, digital artist estates and like all of these things to like steward what, what we're doing. Um, and like, even like for average people, I think it's like really important to think about. Well, it's interesting too, you know, I appreciate that. And also art history in and of itself, such a hassle. Cause I'm always like, you know what the market's best at is just totally blowing through the historical record. Because you're like, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that didn't make money in digital art. And then, you know, when you get new artists and they're like, who are you into? They're like, Rauschenberg or Sol Lewitt. You're like, all right. Well, I mean, you got anyone else? Like, what about like other stuff? You know, like, you know, it's kind of like a pretty popular thing. You know, it's like, I'm into Led Zeppelin. Um, you know, like, what about the deep cuts? I feel like, you know, the, to me, art history has always been a deep cut kind of thing. But like digital art's got such long, crazy histories that aren't written all that much. I mean, there's, they're out there, but there's a lot of unsaid stuff. Like how important is to you folks to, you can put a lot of energy trying to correct the record, right? Like, is that important? Is that possible? The, uh, you know, the digital is the most fragile of mediums, you know, the most effervescent, the easiest to, to lose. 
um, you know, and this is true, this has nothing to do with blockchain, um, but just the, the nature of that, of that information, you know, and this is, and again, media art, artists have dealt with this all the time, institutions, you know, you've got a whole shelf of, uh, you know, VHS tapes, or you've got all of these 16 millimeter films, you know, you've got a bunch of high eight tapes. In my studio alone, I've got, I don't know, eight different analog tape formats or digital <laughs> tape formats. You know, and I've been kind of going through, and it is... A you got a zip disk? Yeah, I, that, that I was able to archive and finally move past, zip, but, um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it's insane. And so, you know, the legacy thing, it's interesting, you know, it's like, you, you care, like I'm speaking as a maker, you know, and I've got, you know, a long body of work. I care about it, but I don't care about it. You know, it's like, it's important, and there's, there's some things in there that I really like, but I can't be worried about it all the fucking time. You know what I mean? It's like, I gotta move forward. You know, I've gotta do my, you know, kind of go on. And so artists are not the best stewards of their work in the long haul. Do not ask an artist, well, I've been asked many times, making technology art, to show up at the museum, whatever, they've got it, they pulled it out, it's in the crate, and they're like, can you fix the thing, like whatever, and I'm just like, I just I hated it. Honestly, that was what made me stop making, um, embedding tech in the sculpture. So it's just like, I can't fucking deal with the, ma the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance, do not ask me, cannot do it. And so the, the legacy thing or the archival thing, the ongoing kind of long-term support is super important. And, and what's the work that is now being rediscovered kind of from the digital art, you know, kind of archives that's coming forward is the artists that were, that were doing plotter drawings, pen, you know, ink on paper. That work from the 60s, still exists and that's been you know but um you know original prints of um you know uh, uh john whitney's you know uh, matrix three one of the first computer animations fucking beautiful animation you know do those exist can you get that you know so the so you know work on paper you know uh paper records you know digital it's tough it's going to be tough yeah i think in terms of like writing the historical record it is important because like you know, I, I learned recently that like Alan Imtaj, a man from Barbados, like invented the world's first search engine and it's called Archie and um, he's black. And like, I think like, you know, as, as we amplify these different stories or parallel histories of who contributes to digital art and culture, it kind of makes it easier for like, people to feel like they can just jump right in. Um, there's sort of like, you know, a stereotype of like, who is most effective in these spaces. And I think it's, it's just cool to kind of make that more, um, yeah, to have more multiplicity. Appreciate that. Let's go to our, Okay, audience, we're going to go over to you. First of all, let me just ask you, who here, if I don't want to out you, who here owns an NFT? Let me just see, anybody? Well, all right, all right, good job, good job. Who here's made an NFT? All right, all right, all right, all right cool. I'm, just, I'm trying to get a, some stats, look around, it's all good. Um, who here feels torn between RL art events and NFT art events? Anybody? Oh yeah, you got some stress, stress, stressors, stressors. All right, cool. I appreciate that. Um, I would love to take some questions from you, this great crew here. Oh yeah, go ahead, um, Emily. How do I do this? I just walk. Uh, out. Just for you guys, and then you can kind of repeat the question. All right. All right. Uh, thank you guys all for being here today. Fantastic panel. Um, I'm wondering. Here, here. Just take this. Come on. <laughs> no problem. I'm wondering if you guys would share your thoughts on a lot of marketplaces that are moving to make a payment of royalties optional, um, essentially like a tip because they're not enforceable at the contracts level for mm -hmm. anybody who doesn't know who is behind me. Um, and I also wonder, I, I have a thought and I wonder if I could share it with you and if you have any thoughts on my thoughts. So um, I've been thinking about reframing the way we think about um, artist royalties, specifically on fine art NFTs, where um, if you think about the artist's intention in traditional media, like if an artist adds a frame to an artwork or the way that an artist wants the orientation, horizontal or vertical, that's honored. Um, and if it's not, if you remove the frame or replace it, it, it influences negatively the value of the work. And so I've been th starting to think about instead of NFTs as a certificate of authenticity or provenance tracker, but also as a, like a frame, a digital frame that um, if it is not honored, um, that, that, you know, perhaps we could not we, but like um, 
you know, could we make it negatively influence the value of the work if a work was shown as being default on payment of NFTs? And it could apply also to, to collectibles, where if, uh, if it's in default, you know, you don't get to go to the parties or get the merch or whatever, but um, just, yeah, any, any thoughts? I appreciate that. Thank you for that. And just, let's, just quickly, people talk about the promise of NFTs. I think often that's referred to as part of the royalty thing is not a small part of what the promise was. I can talk a bit to the royalties. Part. Yeah, and I just want to say this, though. You know, it is a long history in the arts of artists trying to get their fair share of secondary sales. But I also think part of this is holding a... Try, you know, I think just forget the, what the promise of Web3 is. Artists have long been trying to get a better grip on the economies of the arts and their relationship to it. So it is, I think it's a fundamental question. And there are marketplaces that have stopped respecting those royalties. And then there are marketplaces that are like, we are the ones that respect royalties. So I'll turn it over to the panel for your thoughts. But I think it's, I'm so glad you brought it up. Sure, I know, I like, I know it looks like Kevin wants to say something after too, but it's a very interesting story. Um, so as OpenSea changed their, the contracts in their code, we are we were getting ready to mint one of our NFTs um, for Refraction. And as we looked at the code and we saw what was going on, um, we were partnering with Zora at the time. This was just like a few weeks ago. And we said like, we can't mint this on Zora unless we change the entire contract. And so what we did is we actually worked with Zora and OpenSea to rewrite the contract so that artist royalties were reinstated. And then now we're gonna be sharing that code with like artists throughout any platform that supports royalties. So the, one of the most interesting things about Web3 is that you can have one side of it trying to do things like this and take away things like royalties, but at the same time, you can actually completely change that at the same time if you have the right intention. Yeah. And I'll let Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully by now, People, if you've you know been involved with this technology, know that the royalties are not part of the NFT itself, and you know kind of part of the you know just massive hype and whatever that you heard endlessly if you were paying attention to this stuff last year was how you know artists were going to magically get these royalties in perpetuity, and you know nothing of the kind. You know that was just you know completely wishful thinking, because the NFT itself is so. Um, impoverished so poor the 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 you know the record itself uh, the, the 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 model that you know kind of has taken over and swept you know kind of things you know called ERC 721 is just so basic and so simple um, but you know like Nato said there's a long history of artists trying to do that you know the canonical example uh, from the from the 70s is the um, what's his name uh, Siegel, Siegelob, Siegelob, thank you, blanking. A Seth Siegelob contract artist royalty resale agreement. Um, and, and it's been really problematic to implement that. You know, there's all kinds of legal problems, legal challenges about its enforceability, whatever, in the, in the physical world. Um, and so it's been just a marginal, a marginal thing. Um, so the NFT world, you know, has a more utopian attitude, brought a kind of utopianism to the early um, uh, implementations of it. And were um, you know, and then and then implemented these these um, resale royalties at the marketplace level, at the discretion of the marketplace. So it was always at the discretion of the marketplace. It was always kind of dependent on their infrastructure to to play out. And so it was always pretty fragile and pretty unrealistic. Um, uh, you know, in a kind of like hard nosed way, it's it's unrealistic. Um, you know, an artist could do something about it. You could you could ex you could you could create an expanded. NFT uh, in terms of your programming on the blockchain that either forces a sale to go through you, for example, or you kind of build a marketplace into your thing, but that's nuts. That's expensive, that's hard, it's complicated, no one's gonna do that. You could embed in a, a, a kind of veto clause where it's just like, I can block your transfer, um, you know, after the fact, you could, these would be easier to code in, you could encode in a kind of clawback where you would just like, I got it now, right? And those are things that could, you could, you could build into the contracts and those would be doable. Um, I don't know that people have done that. Um, maybe they have. I would say this though, but just to go tough. to Kevin's point. It's tough. The infrastructure of the future world is being built right now. And strangely enough, when it comes to NFTs, artists matter. You know how many different infrastructures are built where artists don't matter? So like, it is an important moment we have. And, I, and the fact that it's a long history, I just say, 
to all these points, there's ways that this can be a lot better. And there's, and I think standing up for not just artist rights, but equity, social structures we care about, we don't have to just take on an art world we don't like. You know, it's being built. And you know, what are the values we like? We went through Black Lives Matter too, you know, like indigeneity, questions around equity, questions around sustainability, questions around the global south, who's on our teams. Like these questions should be not ancillary, but forefronted in the infrastructures we build, which are related to artist royalties. It's because I always think it's like, just like, just the artist. I'm like, what about just all of us building a world together? So it doesn't answer your question, but just my two cents. Oh, come on, here, come on. You gotta go, you gotta go up on the mic though. Yeah, sir. Hi, um, I'm Victoria. Hi, um, I implemented the artist royalties contract as an Ethereum contract in 2017 when the, um, when the ERC contract first came out. And we thought that would be a good joke. <laughs> and it was, it, it was true because it was funny, but we had a really hard time getting the art world into it. And we had a really hard time getting tech into it because tech thought it was like weird and art thought, found it kind of threatening. And I think with that contract, if you're not familiar with it, it um, you, it's a contract where you glue the token on the back of the painting. And they would run out of room on the paintings and it, it sort of fell out. But that contract isn't really about royalties, it's about creating privity, which is a legal contract that um, extends the chain of responsibility from the artist to everybody who owns it. And I think that's a different way of looking at, at maybe the function of blockchain. So I guess my question is like, if we're gonna look at art history as the longest chain, because it's, it, art is earlier than money, what are the ways that we can create a biased ground for the construction of history through, um, through these like visual and digital medias? Um, Wanna take that? Um, that's, that's a great question. What, um, what the last thing you said was, what are the ways that we can create a what kind of record? A, bi like a biased ground. A, a biased ground? Yeah, because I think Andy Warhol like, really did set the stage for those apes to be Interesting. Right. Mm. Okay, just to paraphrase what they said, um, they mentioned that like Andy Warhol maybe like you know is someone that was like a precursor who s set the stage for like something like Bored Apes, right, to be legible, right, or interesting. Um, I struggle with this a lot actually. I think like with art history, like you know they'll kind of give you this really cut and dry narrative. It's like a cheat sheet where it's like, ah oh, yes, like industrialization and like and houseization in Paris created this like you know, whatever, people started like having leisure. And um, with digital art history, I'm curious, like what the, what's the version of like Picasso's, you know, formative painting, like La Demoiselle de Avignon, you know? And it's like, maybe it's crypto punks for some people. Maybe there are other, you know, I, I think like, I would like to get a little bit like further back, like you're saying, where it's like, yeah, if art history is the longest chain, I mean, that's like beyond and older than money, then like, where do we center origin points and like how do we tell these like yeah I think like these biased narratives um, I'll just give a shout out to Mindy Sue who recently published the cyber feminism index which is this really cool hyper textbook that um, is a website and a compilation of like just like the story or like various parallel stories around a topic and I think like yeah really like inserting those like you know things that mess up um, the yeah like the stories and, and complicate them is really interesting so that was definitely a question to your question but I'm curious what everyone else has to say <laughs> it's been really interesting to me just even working in this space and and sort of witnessing you know if as you said like art history is the longest chain the blockchain is creating its own recorded version of history and um, while it's agnostic and automatic um, and permanent it's not necessarily the right one, right? It's, it's kind of, it's creating a history that's still filled with a lot of gaps. It's creating a history that shows all of the transaction hashes between who owns what and when uh, it was traded. But, but I think that it's still missing so much of the richness and the narrative and the culture behind what a lot of the artists who are working in this space are 
are doing and, and putting forth into the world. And by that same token, the art world um, and the art historians and critics that are coming from like the other side of the space that have been you know, sort of hesitant to engage with digital art, engage with NFTs, um, that they're also kind of doing it at a service by ignoring this, this part of history. So it's, it's so strange to me. We're in a really strange time. Um, so I, I'm doing this experiment in the studio right now for the last six months where it's like, okay, Web3 is about you know, being autonomous and being in control of your information. I'm going to set up a server uh, you know, at the studio through my cable modem, you know, access, and it's going to run, it's going to serve up the IPFS files, you know, for the, you know, the, that are associated with my work. It's going to, it's going to serve up, uh, you know, kind of websites. So there's kind of web stuff. I started up a Mastodon interest uh, I instance. Um, and then, oh, and then, and then Urbit, which is a whole other kind of distributed thing, whatever, you know, and it's like, I'm going to run, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try this. Right. And, you know, it works. It, you can do it. It's a, oh, a Bitcoin full node. Um, you know, but it's a total pain in the ass, right? It's really extremely difficult and to maintain those things. And um, and and then it's also, you know, it's like, does it matter, right? Does it does it matter where the bits come from, right? Are they more aesthetic bits? Are they more politically, you know, kind of proper bits coming from my studio versus hosting it on, you know, DigitalOcean or AWS or Microsoft or like whatever. Um, you know, and the whole premise of this, I, I think that it does, you know, because I come, you know, come from this, you know, kind of like weird autonomous, you know, you know, kind of freedom thing, you know, where it's like artists doing their own thing. Um, but it's a tall order, right? It's really, it's really hard. So you're asking a lot for people to really, um, to really do it. And so, you know, this is like, you know, kind of being pointlessly, you know, mountain man-ish or whatever, you know, and so it's, you know, unrealistic, but maybe, and maybe it doesn't have to be all that, you know, because maybe there's other, you know, I think that there are, there is other options kind of in between, but to me, it's really important to, again, identify what your goals are, what is it you're trying to do, and what is it that is important to you um, with using this technology, and how do you frame that, how do you address that? Um, to get back to the art history thing, it's always going to be, there's always going to be an interpretive component, an interpretive layer. The facts on chain are empty in a way. They're real and they're cryptographically true and there's a, a sequence that is the sequence and whatever and all that data can be verified or whatever, but all the stuff that really matters is off chain. You know, it's about it, uh, some kind of interpretive layer, the relationship you have with the artist that's hosting the file, the, the, the relationship you have with your other um, community members when you're doing a DAO. You know, and so it's, you said it's the organization, right? The, you know, the organization or the community or the social layer is ultimately the most important thing. Well, listen, um, it's really hot in here. It's getting hot in here. So thank you, our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming, everyone. I got some totes if you want a tote, Art World tote. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Nada. Thanks for being art supporters. Go get some NFTs. <laughs>